All right, time to look at functions of several variables. We're going to look at a function of two variables um, and do a analysis of that. But some of this stuff came about from, you know, the technology at the time didn't allow for 3D plotting. Um, and so you might argue that some of these techniques are obsolete now, but I think Breaking this down in terms of two-dimensional cross-sections is helpful for understanding it. Um, we'll, it you kind of have to wait until chapter five to see that fully fleshed out. Um, uh, but I, I would stand by that, that these are still helpful things to do. And, um, and it's just part of the curriculum. So uh, we want to start analyzing our function of two variables, probably the way we'd analyze a function of one variable, and that is to determine the domain of the function um, and uh, you want to think of the same functions or operators that might restrict the domain um, so fractions right no division by zero square roots no square root of a negative logs no log of zero or negative um, and then trig functions and their discontinuities um, those are the usual suspects um, looking at our function, uh, z is a function of x and y is equal to the natural log of y over x squared. We've got a natural log, um, so that argument inside there needs to be positive uh, for the result to be real. And uh, we've got a fraction, and that denominator needs to be non-zero for the result to be real. So, uh, so how do you combine those different things? I mean, in when you looked at complicated functions of one variable, you still could have had a natural log and a fraction in the same function. So uh, it's not that different. Um, I just take them uh, individually, right? And uh, and then we try to put those two restrictions together. So uh, let's start with the uh, fraction. And for the fraction, you're just looking at the denominator and you want that to be non-zero. Uh, and so that's gonna be when X is non-zero, right? Um, for the log, um, you want the argument as uh, the inside of the log to be positive, right? And this is where we start to kind of see it be different is that when you set up these restrictions, they will uh, sometimes involve both of your input variables, X and Y. Um, and so it's not so much solving now for one of the variables as it is understanding this as an inequality of two variables. Hopefully, two variable inequalities were brought up at some point. Um, you can think of them as uh, related to, you know, functions. Um, the function uh, for when one variable is equal to the other is sort of the boundary for these inequalities. Um, and uh, you sometimes you can kind of solve for y and and, and treat that uh, in that way. Um, here, if you try to solve for y, you know, you're already looking at when x is not zero, you multiply both sides by x squared, and then you just get that y has to be greater than zero. You can also just reason out, well, it's a fraction. When is a fraction positive, right? When the numerator and denominator are the same sign. The denominator is squared, so it's always positive. And so this is only going to be positive when the numerator is positive. So I get the same conclusion there. Um, so we, we're now going to kind of put this together. The domain is a subset of R2, right? The, the real number plane uh, in two dimensions. And, and so it's often best to graph this. Um, uh, for people that are newer to this, that's the best way to understand and interpret it. Um, so you're welcome to draw a picture of it. Um, but you can also incorporate the use of technology if you prefer. Um, 
So I guess I'll do a, a hand-drawn sketch first. Right, and so you just, well, you know, the way you usually show uh, regions and two dimensions, you just shade the areas, right? And so when X is not zero, that's everything but the Y axis. And when Y is greater than zero, that's everything above the X axis. So that's gonna be all of uh, quadrant one and quadrant two. But that also sort of excludes the X axis and the Y axis. Um, so I don't know, I mean, you can put like a, a dashed line here so that people know that, that those axes are excluded, right? Or even put like a little note there uh, when you're doing it. So it's just the, I mean, if you go back to the original definitions of quadrant one and two, they don't include the axes. So it should be clear, but you can always try to make it more clear. All right, for doing a simple 2D graph like this, if we were to use technology, I'd probably just use something like uh, Desmos. And so I've got Desmos calculator up here and Desmos is pretty good about plotting inequalities. Um, here we just say Y is greater than zero. It, it puts in that dashed line there. Um, I could go in and uh, annotate it later with a dash line on the um, positive y-axis to exclude when x is equal to zero. Um, to get this onto our document, you can, you know, I guess, I'll try to be able to log in. Um, you can share this, uh, export the image or print it. And and then you can sort of insert this image. And then once it's in there, I can go in and put in the the extra dashed line there to exclude that something like that. So um, depends on what you want to do. I think usually people for these just do the sketches, but these things can get more complicated. And um, and so if you need to use technology, that's a kind of demo of that. All right. Uh, now, when you study functions of one variable, we did spend a lot of time finding the domain. You can usually find that with good precision. It's difficult to find the range analytically. Um, you can use graphing to help, though here we kind of need to go to the, the 3D graph and look at the Z values. Um, but I still think this is a helpful exercise, even if you can't always get this to 100% accuracy. Um, and so I do challenge us to try to find the range for this. And it's it's a bit of speculation of like, well, let's imagine all the possible domain values going into this function. What are the output values? And it'll make you think about the outputs of the functions themselves. So think of the the outermost function here is a natural log. Um, you know, what is the range of the natural log function? So natural log function actually has a range of all real numbers, right? Um, it goes down, as you approach zero from the right, it goes down to negative infinity. And as you go to the right, or as X goes to positive infinity, um, it grows very, very slow, but it does actually uh, go up to all Y values. We'll eventually get there. So range for natural log is all real numbers. Now we got to think, can we get to any input value, right? We need all positive numbers to be able to do that. Is there a limit on how big the fraction can get or how close it can get to zero that would prevent this log from hitting uh, the full real numbers uh, in the range? 
Um, and looking at y over x squared, right? Uh, remember, we can make uh, x and y kind of act independently. So you can fix x to be some positive number and then x, sorry, fix y to be some positive number and then x can be, um, x could be made small as you want, getting closer and closer to zero, which will make that fraction get bigger and bigger. Um, and so the argument can make, go to uh, infinity that way. So uh, you fix y, you can just make it one and then let x go to zero from the right and and then y over x squared will go to infinity uh, and then natural log will go to positive infinity. To make it go down to negative infinity, we need to get closer and closer to zero. So there you would just fix x to be equal to one and then let y go to zero from the positives. So if x is one, and then the argument is just y, uh, and so y over x squared will go to zero, and so the natural log will go to negative infinity. So, you know, kind of playing around with the numbers and limits, um, you can determine whether or not the range is the same. Um, so um, you won't find that in a lot of the homework problems or on the test, um, but I like to include that. I think that kind of thinking is helpful. And we still had that. So we had an x not equal to zero. And y equals zero. All right, now we get into level curves and traces. So we saw in the presentation um, for the level curves, we're looking at uh, planes parallel to the xy plane, um, certain constant values for z, kind of slicing it. Um, and then that intersects with the... Uh, with the function of two variables uh, graph, which is kind of like a sheet floating in space. Um, and that gives you those curves that you see in a topographical map. Um, so uh, all you do to get those curves is just put in certain values for Z, which is the left-hand side. And then that gives you X related to Y. You can solve for Y as a function of X sometimes. Um, and then you get these curves. Sometimes you can't solve for y as a function of x, then you just plot it as an implicit curve um, using technology. So uh, I like to use uh, negative one, zero, and one at first, and, uh, and then adjust as needed if those seem too close together. So we're just putting in those constants on the left side. Um, now, you can uh, try to solve here um, and get like, uh, you raise both sides or make both sides uh, exponent with a base E exponential. Uh, and then you would get Y1 is uh, X squared over E. So that's one curve. Uh, doing the same kind of thing for zero. Um, there you're going to get e to the zero, which is one. And so y zero is just x squared. Uh, and then the last one, if you used y to the negative, or, or sorry, yeah, if you use z equal to negative one, um, then you'll get e to the x squared. So those are just parabolas uh, that have a vertex at the origin, but they're being stretched or compressed uh, according to the coefficient there. Um, let's take a look at those graphs. There they are. <clears throat> so 
you can adjust if you don't end up liking how if these are maybe too close together. Um, if we used negative two, zero, and two, we'd get these to be a little more spread out. And that would just give you E squared instead of E, right? Um, and I think that's what I did in the in the uh, in the notes. And then to get the labels on there, um, I'm gonna hold down on the Don't you get the label? All right, so to get the labels on there, like I have in the graph, I thought there was an easier way to do this, and maybe there is, but I'm just not remembering. Um, uh, from what I'm seeing, you just have to create a point. And so let's say we want to add a label to the the bottom, uh, or the very first function here where C was equal to, to two, or sorry, negative two. And I'm forgetting this we had uh, two equals natural log of y over x squared. Okay. All right, so this is c equal to two, c equal to zero, and c equal to negative two. Um, so we want to add a label, say for the c equals negative two one, uh, we pick some point. So let's, you know, just roughly find the coordinates of that point, uh, maybe a little off so that the label's not right on the line. Uh, and so five, three, and it'll put a point there. Um, and then we click label, and then we type in c equals negative two. Um, and then we get rid of the point itself and then hold down there and you can kind of shift it if you need. Uh, and of course, make it the right color. So, uh, I mean, you can also annotate in like whatever tool you're using to do the screen captures uh, and just kind of write on there by hand. But um, that is helpful to have those labeled. So um, let's... Do that for the other ones real quick. Uh, so here, maybe two, three, and that one will be red. And that's when C equals zero. And then the last one, uh, Maybe we want that right up here. So uh, two and a half, five. Oops. That's good. That's when C equals two. Oh, one and a half, five. Sorry, we want that one and a half, five. There we go. So now we've got those labeled, and we can go ahead and get a screenshot of, of that. Maybe get rid of the minor grid lines. So there's a nice graph for us. You can also just kind of use a snipping tool to grab these. All right, um, then we get on to vertical traces. Um, so again, maybe to interpret this, right, this is sort of looking down from above, uh, like you're looking down from 
the positive Z down to the XY plane, and you're seeing the topographical map view of this function, um, it's hard to tell whether it's kind of headed up towards like the higher Z values um, as you get closer towards the Um, as you get closer towards the positive y-axis, that is what's happening, um, as opposed to like maybe it going down. That's something you kind of learn um, as you move along. But, you know, remember these C values, those are the Z values. And so by having those there, we'd say, oh, well, C equals zero. That's that red line is when you're at the XY plane. And then this one is going up and then that one's going down. And then you get a better feel for it. So... Um, as long as you have a kind of solve for Z, then uh, the bigger values you pick uh, in for the level curves, those are going to be the higher elevations or altitudes, and then the lower ones are going to be lower. So instead of uh, looking at intersections with planes parallel to the XY plane, we could look at kind of cross sections parallel to the XZ or YZ plane, um, and then we call those traces. <clears throat> Those planes would be kind of vertical in the sense that we normally orient the three-dimensional coordinate space with Z being vertical. And these are kind of planes parallel with that Z axis. Um, and so we have a choice here. You can let X be a constant or you can let Y be a constant. We like to do both and take a look at, at what those would be um, from this other perspective. So another two-dimensional cross-section just from a different perspective. So let's give ourselves a little more room here and let's remind ourselves what our function is. And let's start with a vertical trace for X or Y. Now you can pick, again, pick simple numbers here. Um, I sometimes will pick zero for X and Y um, when I can, but you can see picking X for zero, pick, yeah, picking zero for X is outside the domain and picking zero for Y is also outside the domain. So think of what you did in step one with the domain restrictions um, and pick some appropriate values of X and Y that where D, Z is defined. Um, the next easiest number to pick, of course, is one. So let's pick uh, X to be one. And then the function simplifies to a natural log of y, right? And so this is just the regular natural log function. I mean, you can even draw kind of a, a hand-drawn sketch here. Um, but these aren't x, y axes anymore, right? This is a y axis, and that's the z axis. So pay attention to that difference. Otherwise, this is the kind of normal natural log function, a little slanted due to my poor handwriting. Uh, we'll get a better computer generated graph again, but you can do sketches if you can draw a decent sketch of those functions. Um, now for y, we pick y to be one as well. And this function simplifies to natural log of one over x squared. All right, now suddenly I don't really know exactly how that's gonna work anymore. Um, uh, natural log of one over X is a little beyond what I can just create. I mean, we could plot some points and do it, but I would just shift over to uh, technology for that graph. So let's uh, get some graphs there and then uh, keep in mind that we are not using Y and X for our axes anymore. Well, you can often use the same letters you did before, um, but you might get into trouble. So we tried typing in that first one when X is one, Z equals natural log of Y. Um, and what's happening is Desmos is interpreting uh, Y as the vertical and Z as the horizontal, which is not what we wanted, right? So can't always do that. It, it seems like if you're going to use X or Y, it's going to use X as horizontal and Y as vertical, um, which that'll end up working for the other one. Um, and so what we can do instead is just change this to an X. That is the graph we wanted. 
Um, and then when we um, sort of grab that graph, we can um, say what the axes are, right? That this is the Z axis and that that's the Y axis. So that's a vertical trace um, where the uh, plane is parallel to the YZ plane, of course. Let's try the other one. And so for that one, we just had Z equals natural log of one over X squared. We can type that one in as written. And um, this, we really like the graph that I had in there, so I'm going to replace it. And, and then we can kind of go in and annotate this. I like to arrows on these. So it is kind of a mix of the natural log curve shape with this symmet symmetry of the uh, reciprocal squared function. Um, but again, this is the x-axis, right? But this is the z-axis. So that's C equals natural log of one over X squared. All right, so we've kind of looked at the different parts of the elephant. Now it's time to look at the whole thing. Um, we've been using a bunch of different tools and you can use Calcplot 3D or GeoGebra. In fact, Desmos even has a 3D graphing thing. I haven't messed with it. Um, but since we're expecting a lot of Python stuff, I'm gonna try to shift over to using uh, Python uh, when we can here, and uh, let's show how to get that graph in Python. In fact, it's already in lab four, but let's just walk through it. So the final step is to get a 3D graph and kind of compare it with everything we've seen. So if you go into the share folder and you go into Calc 3 and you open up lab four, which goes along with chapter four, um, you will have the first example showing how to just plot a function of two variables. So run the boilerplate code at the top. And then we look at our code here. We have to set the domain for X and Y. Now, when you put in uh, X and Y values that cause uh, problems, it can make the graph look pretty bad. Um, you can always start with negative 10 to 10. Uh, this is what I was saying. X goes from negative 10 to 10, and we have 100 points in between. Um, and if I try negative 10, for y here, um, and then uh, then I'm including those y values where it's log of a negative, and it's going to get a little upset. Um, and then this creates a mesh grid of those points. Um, and then when you define your function here, use the capital X and capital Y, um, and then use uh, the NP prefix for any special functions, since we are numerically calculating these points. So then you get all your z values. Um, and then you kind of create the, the 3D graph. Uh, and then uh, this is where you actually plot it as a surface. So X, Y, and Z are the points, and then a bunch of other stuff that you can feel free to change. So it gives me a little error message because I've included the log of the values, but it doesn't really mess it up. Um, so I'm going to go back to going just a little, um, after zero, because remember log of zero is also undefined. And so this will avoid that warning. Um, all right. So let's take a look at this. Uh, well, we kind of already seen the domain, uh, restriction there that, um, Y needs to be positive. It doesn't seem to be bothered by the fact that X is zero in this, but of course, 
you can kind of see the three-dimensional equivalent of a vertical asymptote um, happening right here, right? So it's, it's rising up on both sides um, where X is zero. And so there is a, a vertical asymptote there um, that's showing that domain restriction. Uh, in terms of the uh, level curves in step three, um, we can see those um, formed like this, right? So those are the kind of parabolic level curves um, of this thing. Uh, to see the vertical traces, <clears throat> you can see most easily the vertical trace for when y is a constant, right? Showing that log of one over x squared, those shapes, right? You can see that. You need to kind of adjust your perspective to see the other one. Um, and uh, that would be kind of these shapes, right? That's just the regular natural log function for when uh, x is a constant. So all those kind of come together uh, and give us this overall shape. Um, and then with these, I think, I'm not sure if you can right click and copy that. I guess I just um, did a another screenshot of that. You can make that figure smaller. It does seem a little big. Get small enough to actually grab a good screen capture by adjusting those two numbers there. Yeah, that looks better. Um, and then go ahead and get a nice uh, screenshot of that. And then you can include that for step five. All right. So <clears throat> uh, essentially doing a bunch of graphing, but also a domain range analysis here uh, for these functions of two variables. Um, no calculus yet. That'll be in the next one. So I'll see you in the next video. We'll look at doing some calculus with these functions.